He holds several patents, and he has held numerous uh, positions of leadership in national organizations, including having been the president of the ASGE, which I think most of you know is a very important partner organization for us. Um, interestingly, when I asked Dr. Gastaut if there were any particular credits uh, that he wanted me to mention or things to be sure to talk about, he identified three things. And I think when you hear what these are, you'll understand why this uh, characterization of an innovator is such a prominent part of, of Chris. Uh, number one, he directs the Developmental Endoscopy Unit at Mayo Clinic, which he founded in 1998. Developmental Endoscopy. This is where uh, the focus has been on the resection and apposition of tissue using flexible endoscopy. And this has really been the platform which has launched a lot of the zeal and interest for a lot of the submucosal tunneling techniques that are now emerging, uh, including a submucosal tunneling technique for endoscopic heller myotomy to treat achalasia. Number two, he has identified that he's the founder of the one and only GI bleeding team. And uh, third, uh, one of the founding members of the Apollo Group. Now, the Apollo Group has been instrumental in helping notes emerge and also the emergence of flexible endoscopic suturing techniques. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to his lecture. I'm proud uh, to have Dr. Gostout uh, as a colleague at Mayo, uh, but as a member of the NOTES Joint Committee and the NOSCAR group, as a member of our society. He is a, a member of SAGES, and today as our Carl Stortz lecture, uh, Dr. Gostow. Great, Dan, thanks ever so much. Um, it's, uh, it was really uh, quite a surprise to be asked to uh, present this uh, lecture this morning. I I'm truly honored and I'm very thankful to have an opportunity which I really think is an opportunity. Uh, and I've really been looking forward to uh, uh, making you think, I hope, a little bit differently uh, when I conclude my talk this morning. So uh, you can, you've heard who I am. You can see on the slide some of my credentials. And you can see the title of my talk. I'm going to talk about developments as well as some new developments. And I would like to draw you uh, your attention towards what's all this about for you uh, from a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, what are the challenges particularly for you, as most of you are MIS, uh, but are really rigid laparoscopic surgeons and, and maybe not too complex of flexible endoscopists. So let's take a look at this. This is the outline of what I intend to cover. I'm going to review some perspectives, at least my perspectives in flexible endoscopy. I'm going to go over uh, some changes in the flexible endoscope that I really think have value for you on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe some opportunities that you haven't thought of before. Uh, I'm going to review some revisions that I think uh, are needed in the flexible endoscope and are, and are probably underway. And then I'm going to review some new interventions, some of which I regard as bridging therapies that will take us from the more simplistic flexible endoscopy to uh, the notes arena, uh, ultimately. And then I'm going to make some statements to perhaps realign your thoughts about flexible endoscopy. First, uh, some comments about the pace of change. We all get very enthusiastic about new techniques and we get enthusiastic ab about new technology, but when we really look at it, we're really talking about an eight to 10 year period from a technology concept to fall into your lap for some initial use. It's a phenomenally long period of time, despite enthusiasm and desire, and there's a lot of forces that interplay, obviously the economy, uh, industry, if a technology doesn't fit the long-term, even short-term strategy of an industry, it can get buried despite enthusiasm and demand by all of us. Um, so there's a lot of influences on interplay of this. If you just look at the flexible endoscope, uh, we can have the semi-rigid early fiber optic scope of the late 50s, early 60s, and then the true flexible endoscope that came on board in the late 60s, and finally the video endoscope. So there's a time framework uh, that you can get some perspective on. 
What about flexible endoscopy in digestive diseases? Well, here's the burden of digestive diseases in the United States. We've got 70 million uh, patients affected per year. These ultimately translate into about uh, 100 million office visits. It's a huge uh, impact and the cost burden of our health care and, and our economy. If we look at the top 10 diseases, and as you look through these diseases, think about where the flexible endoscope is working within these diseases and how well are we doing in matching the top 10 diseases with applications in flexible endoscopy. We don't do too badly with gallstone disease. We do okay with peptic ulcers and perhaps pancreatitis and liver disease. And here we have GERD on the top list uh, that really dominates the top 10 diseases. And what are we really doing in flexible endoscopy? It's been a rough road to establish endoscopic therapy for uh, gastroesophageal reflux diseases. So let's take a look about uh, into the recent changes of the flexible endoscope. The ultra-thin endoscope, this is an instrument that most of you are probably thinking, well, you know, this is just a diagnostic tool. It's done for people who don't want sedation. You stick it through the nose. Um, but ultra-thin scopes have really morphed into quality instruments. The image quality of these, of these tools uh, is far superior than it was even four or five years ago, such that this instrument it provides an opportunity through any orifice. So we have notes, natural orifice, and the ultra-thin endoscope is a perfect tool to travel through fistulas and iatrogenic orifices uh, to relieve what can be incredibly frustrating scenarios. So here's a, a medical illustration that highlights the use of the flexible thin endoscope to retrograde pass through a peg site up the esophagus and help open up a complete obstruction in a patient who has had an ENT surgery, radiation, and now has a complete obstruction of the pharyngoesophageal junction. So you can use a standard endoscope and a flexible endoscope to gain access from the backside. That's kind of ho-hum, it's been around, but how about this? Here's a patient that we just did recently, a patient who had uh, severe pancreatic uh, necrosis, uh, Waldorf necrosis that ultimately localized in the right perinephric area. There was an attempt made by radiology to resolve this with a catheter drainage, perfect role for the ultra-thin endoscope to be passed through the fistula tract, examine the necrotic area and determine whether or not ultimately we need to be more vigorous endoscopically, dilate the tract, and get some more therapeutic instruments in there so we can manage this localized uh, necrosis collection. So we need to think differently about the ultra-thin endoscope. It is a tool ready to your hands and a great opportunity uh, to overcome some difficult and challenging problems. What about the therapeutic endoscope? Well, we have multiple channels. Um, these are fine, but we're finding out now with the advent of notes that we need larger channels than the typical dual channels that are there. We can have jumbo channels. Those are nice, and those are really valuable in the management of acute GI bleeding. That's been a, a real advantage, a re fairly recent advantage. We have instruments with multiple elevators, as you see down here. Now, talking about the pace of change, uh, as you can see, this, has, this scope has two channels, and it also has two elevators that allows some freedom of movement. The downside of multiple channel instruments is that you're working continually in parallel with your devices, uh, which is a, a major disadvantage, as you may well know. And here, you have the opportunity of swinging instruments laterally and vertically. Interestingly, this instrument has been around for about a decade now. So we hear more of it lately, but it's a tool that's really taken some time to evolve the pace of change. How about alternative imaging? This is a new style of imaging. It's called narrowband imaging, and it's a technique that contrasts layers, mucosa from submucosa. And as you can see here, it's a technique, an imaging technique, or a technology rather, that highlights vasculature, uh, and it also highlights surface uh, patterns and uh, topography. Here is a, a very diminutive polyp, as you can see, stands out very nicely in this imaging, but more importantly, I want you to focus on the dominance of the vascular pattern that you see using narrowband imaging. This is an imaging style that's going to enter into the world of laparoscopy. It's an imaging style that can be to your advantage in determining vascularity, health of vascularity, and even identify uh, minute areas of potential um, uh, metastatic disease that may guide decision-making during a more extensive operation. 
What about the potential revisions that can occur with the flexible endoscope? The most fundamental decision that needs to be made in, in the further evolution of the endoscope, I think, is conceptualizing whether the endoscope is going to remain a tool or will it be a conduit for tools. It's a very important decision because it really will impact how this scope morphs and is manufactured put in your hands. So I had mentioned earlier, we have multiple channels. There's a limited amount of real estate that you can put in a flexible uh, tube for these purposes. You can certainly add channels, but channel size will become an issue. You can add more imaging capability. So you can have direct imaging, perhaps oblique imaging, or you can take the single camera, have it exit the tip of the scope, and have it serve as a revolving eye so that you can have complete 360 degree imaging. That would be a really fantastic revision. Um, we still have a problem with parallelism through single, double, or even triple channel scopes. We can sometimes overcome that by adding channels and adding over tubes. Physicians tend not to like over tubes, but they can be quite useful. So it's a fundamental decision. Tool or conduit for tools. This is a, uh, a medical illustration that I drafted in 1998 when I opened our developmental endoscopy unit and I showed it to our first fellow. And I said, your work is going to be designed to recreate this in reality. Hands-free endoscopy. We spend a lot of time hanging onto the scope, wasting a hand and an arm. And we have to bring in all kinds of hands and arms to facilitate us. And ultimately, this is what we need to do. We need to let go of the scope and use our hands with instruments through that. This is an instrument that uh, was introduced last year that I think is hitting the mark insofar as some of the comments I'm being made. I've just uh, uh, made, for example, although it's a two-channel instrument, as we can tell here, there's an effort made to provide some type of triangulation by splaying out the instruments as they exit the tip of the scope. There are two channels. It's an opportunity for hands-free uh, work using two hands, using independently functioning instruments within that channel. Getting closer to that mark, and this is the mark that I think we need to strive towards. Now I'm going to tell you about some of the work I've been doing and I think how it will impact you. Um, this is a project that we call the PSYOP project. It started in 2003. It was called the Submucosal Inside Out Project. The intent of PSYOP was to expand the opportunity of mucosal resection, allow us to take larger swatches of mucosal disease off uh, more safely and clearly more efficiently, uh, which is something that the U.S. Uh, surgeon would like to have. But we ultimately realized that this is a technique that also could provide interesting and perhaps safe access for evolving methods as notes. We got confident to the point when NOSCAR uh, first assembled it was uh, added to the white paper as an opportunity for investigation and research. So just to illustrate what I'm driving at, this was a concept that we thought we could take uh, the submucosa and destroy it, turn it into a free or working space within which you can put tools or an endoscope. By doing that, you have the opportunity of, of taking large areas of mucosal disease out with a direction towards the lumen, which is radically safer than working towards the outside of the bowel. So it may eliminate perforation, could eliminate uh, issues with regard to bleeding. And then as we realize this offset entry through a tunnel, uh, ultimately, there's uh, also an opportunity for an offset exit or access to perhaps the deeper layers of the gut wall or passing through the gut wall uh, to other areas of body cavities. And that evolved into our submucosal endoscopy with mucosal flap. Now, Dan had mentioned uh, this in, my in, in his introduction to me. And here's a video that shows some of our earliest work uh, creating this submucosal tunnel. This is the porcine esophagus. We're washing it with betadine, ultimately not needed at this time. But the goal here is to enter the submucosa, as you see with a fluid bleb that's created by a standard injection needle. There's an EMR cap fitted to the tip of the endoscope. It's not really all that necessary, but uh, we happen to be using it for this particular case. And this is a technique that, that uh, allows you to tunnel into the submucosa. Uh, we're going to be using an uh, off-the-shelf ERCP uh, stone retrieval balloon to accomplish that. This technique has caught on uh, all around the world, and everybody's evolved their own method for creating the submucosal tunnel, and that's great. Uh, we're still stuck with the balloon idea because we like the idea of using a very soft 
compliant tool to make that space uh, requirement uh, come to reality. And as you can see, this is slowly working down the length of the esophagus, creating a variably length, uh, uh, variable length submucosal tunnel that the endoscope can ultimately be placed in. And in this video on the right that I'll run simultaneously as you're watching the tunnel being created, this is the use of the uh, EMR cap to create a very localized, full thickness myotomy. It's about a two centimeter diameter myotomy using a very conventional EMR style. We do this because it's safe. Uh, we know that if we're in the distal esophagus, we're not gonna pull in any structures by bringing the muscle wall into the cap, cutting it off. And once that's done, we can then open up the myotomy further. Uh, an interesting thing that's led on to the treatment of achalasia, and I do believe that this probably will be the ultimate uh, replacement for the laparoscopic myotomy will become an endoscopic myotomy. And here's an insulated tip needle knife. It's actually across the GE junction, and it's going to zipper up uh, the distal end of the esophagus and the esophageal muscle layer, the lower esophageal sphincter, creating a full thickness uh, myotomy from the perspective of the muscle layer. Okay. What about these new interventions? Uh, they can be bridging therapies, meaning they have a time limit in perhaps their usefulness as we move on to more extensive. I've just commented on myotomy for achalasia. I do believe that endoscopic myotomy for achalasia will definitely be the thing of the future, um, and it will come here faster than we think. What about on-block excision? Because of the cost of care, when we take off large colon polyps, um, there's no guarantee we get the whole polyp off. We have to bring patients back in short intervals of time. We really need to be striving towards on-block excision. And so we, I would like to apply our tunneling technique, our SEMR method, for removing large areas of mucosa. But I think ultimately our goal will be to move into full thickness resection once we have the tools in our hands. So here's a video that demonstrates using the same tunneling method to accomplish a large resection of uh, a mucosal area. So first there's a submucosal fluid cushion created to establish the submucosal space. And then here, a tunneling balloon is inserted underneath the mucosa and you'll watch and you'll see this slowly move uh, towards the distal, uh, the distal stomach, creating about a 10 centimeter length tunnel that's about 18 millimeters in uh, diameter. So it's a highly compliant balloon uh, that's not disruptive to the deeper layers of the gastric wall, and it creates uh, an effective working space that will theoretically isolate a disease uh, process, let's say located right where I'm swinging this uh, little pointer. So once the tunnel is made, that balloon is transferred, pulled out, and the space is then sized with a separate instrument, a sizing balloon. So here you get a view of the actual tunneling balloon. It's kind of like a party favor. And um, there'll be some views off to the side where you'll see some areas of mucosa that have already been resected uh, in comparison to what's being done uh, actively in this video. So here's the sizing balloon uh, that's then placed into the tunnel. The balloon, as the balloon is inflated, one can distribute the submucosal space to the diameter that's desirable to obtain free margins of uh, uh, a targeted lesion. Here's an area that's been resected. This is a technique, uh, unlike ESD, that may take hours to do. This is a technique you can get done in probably less than 15 minutes, taking off an average of an eight to 10 centimeter area of mucosa. So, what about freehand suturing? If you talk to flexible endoscopists and ask them what they want to have in their hands, one of the first things that always pops up is we want to be able to suture. We want to be able to duplicate the curved GI needle and bring it into the lumen. Well, we have that capability now. We have a device that works in unison with the endoscope. Wherever you drive the tip of the endoscope, you drive your needle. And uh, it does mimic the action of the curved needle. Uh, here's an example. Um, of a gastrotomy that's being closed using the overstitch device. As you see, it does, it does benefit from the use of a forceps to grab the edge of the cut margin and uh, allow you to drop these stitches that can be placed full thickness and allow eventual closure. The uh, endoscopic view is not impaired by this, and as you, as you can see, it's fixed to the tip of the scope. So wherever the scope is, your stitches and your needle placement can be. Long, long time overdue, but finally in our hands.
bariatrics. If we gave everybody a note card in this room and asked you to develop an intraluminal bariatric method, we'd have all sorts of interesting things popping up. One problem that we do have, as I stand here and say, oh, let's go to on block excision, we don't have any methods to guide us to the endpoint of therapy. So we make all our decisions by estimations, looking at the tissue, maybe putting some dye on it, using um, NBI imaging, but we have no true image guided therapies, and these are yet to come, and they will come. We'll have, uh, perhaps in the next five years ago, uh, five years from now, excuse me. Uh, an opportunity to use technology, non-radiologic technology, non-EUS technology, to define the endpoint of flexible endoscopic intervention in the gut lumen. We have something close to that now, and these are EUS-guided therapies. In our, for our GI bleeding team, we now have an on-call endosonographer who does angiographic intervention. So if we have a refractory bleeder that's not a good candidate for the OR, it's not even a good candidate for the interventional radiologist, we can, we can often resolve the bleeding problem by endosonography and direct access to the bleeding vessel and putting our own coils, put our own, our own glues, and now we're using nanoparticle-based drug therapy to treat cancers through EUS-guided therapies. What about ERCP? It's long overdue for a shift uh, in how we handle ERCP. And in diseases that predominantly involve the extrahepatic bile duct from the hilar region down, there's really no reason in some cases that we need fluoroscopy. Uh, we could probably do ERCP at the bedside and in the standard procedure room without radiology if we're interested in just the management of uh, extrahepatic duct disease using the thin scopes. The image quality, the opportunity for alternative imaging allows us to identify potential dysplastic areas. We certainly can manage stone disease after lap coli uh, by non-fluoroscopic direct entry uh, cholidocostomy. Uh, cholidocoscopy, excuse me. So I, I slipped through bar uh, bariatrics rather quickly, but what are the endoluminal options? We, also, we always have to think about the extraluminal options. Yes, this is a real patent um, uh, from 1982, I believe, and um, it's extreme, but sometimes extreme things are needed to work. So space-occupying devices, these are predominantly the balloons. They're not going to go away, they're here. They do have some bridging qualities to them. We're seeing and hearing about conduits of all kinds uh, in all locations in the GE junction through the pylorus, conduits with obstructions, pyloric and esophageal plugs, even Botox of the antrum to delay gastric, gastric emptying. With the advent of uh, flexible endoscopic suturing, we're, we should be seeing gastric reduction rise to the surface here. We should also be seeing with notes the evolution of omental lipoplasty to specifically for control of the metabolic syndromes. What about gadgets in adjuncts? This is something that uh, we uncovered that's a great boon to mucosal resection is the application of mesna into the GI world. By mixing this a solution of mesna, injecting it into the submucosa, it softens it incredibly so, so it's much easier to take uh, mucosal-based disease off through mucosal resection methods. This is something that I believe will catch on. Magnets. You're hearing and you're seeing things uh, with regard to magnets, and why is that? That's because the composition of magnets, we're learning more how to build better magnets, because of varying compositions of magnets, we can change form of magnetic materials, we can vary the strength of those materials, and we can even, and we can even introduce flexibility in the world of magnets. So we're, uh, we're yet to see uh, the benefits of magnets. So there's all magnets, all shapes and sizes, and uh, all of these have appeal, uh, but we can take magnets and we can turn it into a magnetic slurry and you can bolster or build areas that you need to work, get them out of the way. Uh, there was an excellent um, uh, abstract presented yesterday using a magnetic solution uh, to, for the purposes of deflection of the bowel. So we're gonna hear and see more about uh, magnets, maybe just simply from retrieval tools to transfer tools. We've uh, actually developed a technique for a scopeless peg that doesn't even require uh, radiology. It's simply a totally magnetically guided peg procedure that can be done anywhere at the bedside, could be done in an army field hospital in Afghanistan. 
Uh, have you seen uh, anastomoses being created by magnets? Well, this is kind of a similar process, but it just requires you to swallow a magnet. Um, and then what about GERD? Uh, here's an, a really slick device, the necklace, the magnetic necklace, uh, that does offer an opportunity and an alternative to standard, uh, standard Nissen fundoplication. A uh, very nice application of, of uh, strong magnets. The other area of gadgets and adjuncts that we'll see will be personnel reducers. In all the videos that we see, there are lots of hands coming in to especially notes procedures, and we've got to get rid of those hands, and there are alternative ways to handle the devices we put through these multiple channel instruments, um, and you'll see some simple, simply designed personnel reducers. These are not robotics. Robotics are fairly expensive. We've got to go for the simple and easy, especially uh, with the changes afoot in our healthcare system. So having said all this, what's really in this for you? So how do you adopt uh, new techniques? Are you an early or a late person in the adoption of uh, new technology and techniques? One thing, this is the shape of things to come. Notes, the hoopla's gone in notes. Now it's the reality of notes. Um, it's in practice. Um, we're discovering that we don't have to worry about things like contamination. Um, what we do need to do is we need to identify the right patients and the right procedures. And this is something when you leave today, you need to do that as well. More importantly, you are right now in an ideal zone of flexible endoscopy, an opportunity to take over complex endoscopy and build it, really bring it into the MIS arena. What are gastroenterologists doing right now? What have they been doing for the past four or five years? They're doing colonoscopies. The colonoscope and the colonoscopy is the equivalent of the US dollar for the gastroenterologist. This is a perfect moment for the MIS surgeon to take complex flexible endoscopy and bring it into your court. Bring it into the operating room where some of these procedures really need to get done and established and bring it into your world because it's a great opportunity. There's great technology out there that can uh, satisfy you and satisfy your patients. Think about that. And so it's the site of service that I think it's really important in your decision making uh, is to, for you to not only uh, adopt new technologies and new techniques, but bring it into your arena, bring it into your operating room, and um, start getting more involved with complex endoscopy. So my grandmother used to say, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, things always work out for the best, and there's always a rainbow uh, at the end uh, of lots of uh, uh, severe storms, at least up in our uh, cabin area in northeast Minnesota. I don't know if there's a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, but thank you very much for your attention and uh, coming to listen to my thoughts this morning. I appreciate it. I, I just have to make a comment. Uh, we have a gastroenterologist who is at the top of his field imploring us to bring flexible endoscopy back into surgery. I, I'm, uh, it's just remarkable. I'm so grateful for you being here, Chris, and giving us this message. I have a plaque for you, and the plaque reads, the important thing in science is not so much to obtain new facts as to discover new ways of thinking about them. Thank you very much.